This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. So this video took a different direction than I initially planned. I was just going to cover Anaconda because that felt like the perfect summer schlock to stick our fangs into, but I quickly realized there is just not enough energy in me to make a full video on it. However, I think I found a way to kill two reptiles with one gigantic stone. As I've said in countless videos, the 90s was a weird decade of identity crisis where horror movies just didn't really know what they wanted to be. Be. Most of them were attempts to simply mimic the magic of the 80s, particularly in slasher movies, causing an influx in sequels, rip-offs and spin-offs, and resulting in what I sometimes call the video store bargain bin era. Yet, amongst the usual genre suspects, there was actually this infrequent reappearance of 40s, 50s style monster movies that exaggerated natural real-world creatures, most noticeably appearing near the end of the decade, which I theorize was partly an attempt to capitalize on the hype slowly generated by the decade-long development hell of America's crime against nature that was Godzilla, which itself became a mutated inbred off the success of Jurassic Park. Part of me thinks Tremors cult following may have had some influence on the trend, but you could make the same argument for Arachnophobia or Starship Trippers, which both grew followings post-theatrical release. Hell, unless I'm forgetting, the only 90s creature feature I think I've given any real attention to is Deep Rising, so I'm not gonna lay claim to having any expertise on this. Anyway, one of the most successful and arguably influential of these 90s man vs. wild films was 1997's Anaconda, the story of a documentary film crew stalked by a gigantic man-eating snake in the Amazon River. However, if snakes are not your murderous reptile of choice, then turn your attention to 1999's Lake Placid, a film that takes all the elements of Anaconda and tells an even less eventful story of a big-ass Asian Pacific crocodile that's migrated to a quiet lake in Maine. The reason I'm pairing these two together despite their reptilian differences is because Lake Placid can pretty much be credited for popularizing killer croc movies like how Anaconda did for its respective creature. In fact, both films spawned their own franchises to the point that, genuinely to my surprise while writing this, they even had an actual crossover. And the hunt is on for their favorite food, <laughs> sorority girls. I'm bored. Now, I know how disappointing this will sound, but there is no way in hell I'm covering any of the sequels, because with the exception of Anaconda Hunt for the Blood Orchid, which I would argue is actually better than the original, all of them are shitty sci-fi channel movies, and I do not get the viewership anymore to subject myself to further alcohol poisoning. Listen, on the off chance this video somehow does exceptionally well, I will consider howevering the ever-loving shit out of those sequels. Just before we go any further, here is a few words from this video sponsor, ExpressVPN. Folks, I come bearing good news. The most insane horror movie of the last few years, Malignant, is currently on Netflix Australia. But Ryan, I don't live in Australia. Well, with ExpressVPN, now you can. No longer must you suffer through your country's limited and boring selection of shows and films when you can use ExpressVPN to select from 94 countries and get your entertainment fix from anywhere you want it. For Malignant, all I did was select Australia from the app's drop-down list, smash that connect button, let ExpressVPN mask my IP address to fool the internet into thinking I'm in the Down Under, and now I'm watching Gabriel doing his stupid murder dance. Additionally, just the other day, I really wanted to see FX's The Bear, which is currently not yet scheduled for a UK release, but searching it on JustWatch.com, I discovered it recently dropped on Disney Plus Canada. So again, I literally pressed three buttons, refreshed Disney Plus, and now I'm as giddy as a dog in a bone shop. Remember when you were too small to get on a roller coaster as a kid? Well, imagine getting a growth spurt so you can access every ride unrestricted. That's what having ExpressVPN is like. For less than $7 a month, ExpressVPN lets you access hundreds of new shows and films on Netflix, Disney+, Shudder, and the list goes on and on. With incredibly fast internet speed so I can stream content in HD with little issue, and the reassurance of critical acclaim, simply click the link in the description box below or go to expressvpn.com slash Ryan to find out how you can get three months free. 
So diving into the two films, since Anaconda is the OG Millennium Natural Monster movie, it's best we start there. Make sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below as we go along, including what I should cover next, and maybe leave a cheeky wee like and subscribe as well. The one thing you have to admit about Anaconda is that it takes itself far more seriously than it ought to, committing fully to its premise in the most grounded way it possibly can. What stands out immediately is just how bonkers the casting is. Like, it's not just the fact they threw together any random actor from the 90s looking for a quick paycheck, all of them seem to think they're in different films. You have John Voight with his butcher Paraguayan accent chewing more scenery than a snake devouring its prey, there's Jonathan Hyde perfectly hamming up his pompous typecast knowing Titanic prestige is just around the corner, Owen Wilson is clearly smoking joints between scenes as he mumbles his way through every line, Eric Stoltz gets paid to pretend to be unconscious for almost the entire runtime, and Ice Cube? I think somebody tricked him into being in this. You want to know something even weirder? The Anaconda is voiced by by Frank Welker, who provides the voices of Fred Jones and Scooby-Doo. Make of that as you will. To JLo's credit, she was going through a bit of a career transition at the time and makes an earnest effort to be taken seriously, and while Hyde deserves credit for playing brilliantly into the campiness of the film, JLo adds a genuinely convincing layer of emotion. Probably the best chemistry in the film is between Jonathan Hyde and Ice Cube, because their characters are such polar opposite personalities that constantly clash before eventually finding common ground. You can tell I have a massive soft spot for Jonathan Hyde because his eccentric conviction to playing this smug, posh television presenter adds a levity to the overtly serious tone of all the other characters. I mean, John Voight might chew the scenery with his god-awful performance, but it's not a fun performance like Hyde's is. His villainy is just too cool, moody, and condescending, with how he tries to project a sinister presence onto his character that falls flat on its face every time. Granted, that attitude does eventually play a role in demonstrating his own hubris, which becomes his own downfall when throwing the characters in increasingly dangerous situations. His character Paul Cerrone is established as a snake hunter who manages to trick his way onto the boat, eventually taking everyone hostage in order to track down and capture the snake. Almost the entire movie takes place in this one location, and of course it's no surprise when the only character to side with Cerrone is Owen Wilson's Gary, whose punchable face and increasing smugness is perfectly utilised to highlight the weasley wee shithead that he is. You would at least think Ice Cube would have some quality lines, but he's painfully wasted here. It's bizarre how a movie that would greatly benefit from his ball-busting antagonism somehow chooses to suppress that persona and have him play a more passive figure. I have a conspiracy theory that the reason he tones it down when the other characters do the opposite is because of a genuine discomfort Ice Cube himself feels about the production. It indirectly gives him a vulnerability that you don't typically see in his persona. It fits that his character hates being in the Amazon rainforest, but there's a bit of rawness in his angst that doesn't seem like a performance. Now, moving along to the titular Anaconda, for such a wild well concept, it plays it way too safe. The film doesn't attempt to be ambitious or too clever, it sticks wholly to what its premise is and doesn't venture beyond what it knows. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but everything ends up feeling flat as a result. Sure, atmospherically, the humid, exhausting conditions are all there, but it's missing a pulse to really energize the drama. When the snake eventually crashes onto the scene, the best way I can describe it is that it does its job. It slithered so that snakes on a plane could, well, fly. However, I do like the chaos of everything. Unlike most movies, they're not actually trying to evade the snake. They're being forced to aid a psychopathic snake hunter who recklessly puts their lives at risk. There are dumb actions that have a purpose, so to speak. Sarome wants to capture the snake alive, and so there's a switch between being the hunter and being the hunted, creating this occasional uncertainty over how safe the characters are in specific scenarios. Now, there is one one detail I want to mention that seemed like it was trying to allude to some sort of supernatural lore around the anaconda. The documentary crew explain that their goal is to document a native tribe within the rainforest, who seem to have a connection to the snake via totems, either acting as a warning to tourists or possibly symbols of deity worship. 
When Sarone has the crew destroy a blockade in the river, it begins raining snakes like a plague sent from the heavens. The question it asks is whether the blockade was designed to prevent something from getting in or getting out. And on top of that, was it to protect outsiders or protect the creature itself? Either way, once the blockade is destroyed, hell is unleashed. Uh, the problem is, it doesn't do anything with it, but it was one of those small details that stuck with me because there is actually a similar deity theme brought up in Lake Placid with how certain cultures worship specific animals. It felt like Anaconda could have done with that mythological undertone to give it more uh, gravitas, shall we say, which is exactly what they do in Hunt for the Blood Orchid, where it reveals anacondas are protecting a sacred supernatural plant that could be used to cure sickness and disease and so on. Ultimately, I respect that Anaconda is trying to keep the whole thing a mysterious freak of nature style event, but I don't see the harm in just a little imagination. In comparison to Lake Placid, Anaconda is certainly the much more entertaining film, but narratively and partially thematically, I will make the argument that Lake Placid does attempt to tell a bit more of a character story, if indeed it suffers from many similar quirks. Like Anaconda, Lake Placid is a lot of waiting around until something happens, except the giant crocodile reveal is withheld until around halfway into the film, and by that point I was so bored all I really cared about was seeing more Betty White, who is the real force of nature in this film. Again, we end up with a bunch of characters who completely loathe each other, with Brendan Gleeson, Sheriff Hank, and Oliver Platt's eccentric crocodile enthusiast Hector Cray having the only interesting and playful conflict akin to Ice Cube and Jonathan Hyde. However, I feel the characters are probably too hostile for their own good to the point it's actually off-putting. It's neither comedic nor charming in the way it intends to be, especially the blatant 90s sexism and objectification that's so uncomfortable that the film even acknowledges it before completely dismissing it. What's it like to be a woman in the woods in Maine? I mean, the guys don't turn all horny or anything like they did in Deliverance, right? In fact, much like Ice Cube's discomfort, I got the impression that the antagonistic performances came from a place of real sincerity, because there is a legitimately talented cast working well below their pay grade, including Bill Pullman and Bridget Fonda, the former of whom being nothing more than a dud who you forget is even there, while the latter gives the only engaging performance outside Oliver Platt. Not only is her character Kelly relatably quirky and self-aware, but all her humour genuinely lacks thanks to a resentful uptight demeanour caused by her bastard boyfriend boss dumping her for her best friend and sending her to Lake Placid so that she doesn't cause a scene. The characters do become a little more tolerable near the end when the crocodile finally appears, but it's too little too late to re-engage me because I was long checked out hoping for it to end. I understand that the film desperately wants to mimic the same dramatic build-up as Jaws, where the less you see of it, the more scary and mythical it becomes. However, since the characters aren't adding any real emotional weight, then surely the carnage should add some gravitas. Well, nope. It doesn't have the same gruesomeness as Jaws, and there's only actually two characters who die in the film. Like, how do you make a giant crocodile movie and not have it tear shit up? Yeah, yeah, grounded realism or whatever. Again, just like Anaconda, it takes itself too seriously and plays it far beyond safe. Although with that said, going back to the mythological undertones I wanted out of Anaconda, the interesting thing about Hector Cray is that once he calms down the eccentricity, there is a poignant scene in which he explains why he has such a devoted attachment to crocodiles. As Kelly explains, Hector Cray is just this lonely guy who means no harm, and simply sees these creatures as divine conduits. He basically worships them, comparing them to dragons that give him enlightenment and a sense of purpose in a life that seems mostly empty. As such, it gives the climax a moral dilemma, where Cray fights to ensure the creature is protected and preserved as ecologically significant rather than euthanized. 
After all, the crocodile is nothing more than an animal surviving in the wild. Yeah, sure, it at like three people, but that doesn't mean it's going out of its way to actually harm people. Hell, when they confront Betty White about feeding the creature, she's confused as to why that's even an issue when there is nobody even actively living near the lake. It's effectively no different than killing any animal in the wild just because it attacked humans. What gives us the right to play superiority and interfere with nature just going about its business? Yeah, it's an anomaly, but Florida would call that a daily occurrence. In a way, I like how it's the reverse effect of Anaconda. Instead of alluding to a supernatural component, it resolves it to being a true conflict between man and nature. However, it does end on a compromise where they manage to capture the crocodile alive, and so Hank doesn't get to use his big gun, but for the sake of Chekhov's satisfaction, they randomly reveal there's a second crocodile mating with it, and then they proceed to blow it the fuck up. And there we have it, Anaconda and Lake Placid. If you made it this far, please let me know your thoughts in the comments below, as well as maybe your favourite 90s creature feature. And until next time, stay safe, stay away from giant man-eating reptiles, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye!